Welcome to episode 117 of the Civil War Breakfast Podcast. Tonight, I am joined by the guy that is insistent that I do the hosting thing every other episode, even though I suck at it. So yes, I'm joined by my co-host Darren tonight, who's far better at intros than I am. I am Mary, and this is my intro for episode 117 of our podcast. (sighs) Wow. Okay. Well, that was a job done. I'm going to give you my Jay Peterman nod on that one. The job done. Anyway, I'm, so, I'm shocked uh, we don't get like, I don't know, anybody ever uh, says anything to me about how I don't know. It is what it is. So what's going on, Mary? It's Friday night. The, the, the day is the, the day is, uh, is is winding down. The weekend is beginning. So we have a lot of cool things coming up this weekend, but we got some business to take care of tonight. So what's mm-hmm. going on with you? Well, it's October. It's a beautiful day here in um, Massachusetts feels like summer almost we were out earlier for a walk so it's really really pretty but we are you know back here recording tonight it's been a couple of weeks since we last recorded an episode so but before we get to our actual episode I uh, just need to take care of business because you always accuse me of never doing this but what are you drinking mm-hmm. tonight oh thank you for asking Mary I seriously um, I'm drinking uh, well I'm drinking boom sauce from Lord Hobo which is a double IPA locally from this uh, this Boston area which is a really really good thing and um, I'm drinking it out of my what would John Brown do mug because it was the anniversary of his reign at Harpers Ferry and his capture this past week down at Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. So I figured that would be a, that would be a good mug. So what about yourself, Mary? What are you drinking tonight? I am also drinking Lord Hobo. I am drinking Angelica, and I am drinking it out of my Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania National Military Park mug because it was the one I grabbed out of our cupboard. And plus, we don't have a mug for the battle we're going to be discussing tonight, which is Bristow Station. Um, so we'll get into that now. So the Battle of Bristow Station is fought October 14th, 1863 in Prince William County, Virginia. It's a few months after the Battle of Gettysburg has been fought, and it does involve some participants from that battle on both the Union side and the Confederate side. That is true, Mary. Anyway, so as I was saying, this past weekend was the 30th anniversary of the movie Gettysburg in the town, as I'm sure is dealing with the fallout from that whole thing. <laughs> in this episode tonight, we're going to talk about is similar in a way. We're going to talk about the fallout of the Battle of Gettysburg campaign um, that went that bled into the late summer and fall of 1863. Yeah. And in the period of late July of 1863 um, to the end of the year is definitely one of the more understudied aspects of the war. But in the East, you know, that dance between Robert E. Lee and George Meade, you know, it mm. continued well after the Gettysburg campaign ended. And I think the perception is after the Gettysburg campaign is over, um, nothing really happened for the rest of the summer and the fall. Yeah. And, and we're going to talk about that. And it's certainly not true. You know, late in the summer of 1863, uh, in the East anyway, you know, you know, both the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia they were sort of feeling each other out a little bit, and they were trying to figure out what the other was going to do. You know, Meade and his army, they're encamped in a place called Warrington, Virginia, which is about 20 miles west of Manassas, near the old ba- the old Bullrun battlefield. Mm-hmm. So despite what you've heard of the contrary, Mary, Meade very much at this point wanted to pursue Lee, and he, I mean, he wanted to see if he can get them to him to do a really a full retreat south yeah. beyond the Rapidan River. He wanted to keep pushing him. Now, Lee's Army of Virginia at this time, they're sitting behind the Rapidan, and they were, they're trying to take their time, and they're trying to reinforce from their losses at Gettysburg from that, from that and all throughout the late summer. And for the most part, they kind of recouped a lot of their numbers because their manpower losses were, were hard. But they grew the, their ranks back up to about 72,000 by the end of the summer. And really both me and Lee, uh, both me and Lee, they both kind of knew their each armies were kind of beaten up. And the yeah. other army was also beaten up. And, you know, through battle losses, it shrunk the army's total. And other factors took a lot of place we're going to talk about um, to help continue to reduce their numbers, especially Lee's Confederates. Now, I don't know if you know this, Mary, but there was a Western theater to the battle of the war, too. I don't know if you've yes. ever heard this. And back in Georgia and Tennessee, stuff was going down. Braxton Bragg and his army of Tennessee, they, he phoned a friend. <laughs> and what he wanted to do was to need help to deal with William Rosecrans in what was going to become eventually the Battle of Chickamauga, right? Mm-hmm. So soon after Gettysburg, and for reasons both military and non-military, Confederate President Jefferson Davis, you know, he thought it was a good idea to take Lee's old war horse, James Longstreet, and his first corps of those battle-tested veterans, 
and send them west, young man. He thought that was the best thing to do. Yeah. It's almost kind and of like I'll, he's in a timeout in a way just because of the fallout from Gettysburg and what happened with Pickett's Charge and all that. But, you know, Rosecrans does need the troops um, at Chickamauga for sure to help him. Well, I mean, brag. Yeah, sorry, Brad. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah, but, Bragg. but you know, Long Longstreet, you know, Longstreet and Lee kind of needed a little bit of time, a little, you know, couple. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I mean. Go like, time, yeah, that's right? what I mean. Like a kind of a timeout. Um, and so, this so was the perfect was, it was, excuse. It, it was probably a good deal, but at this time, like I said, Lee had just grown his army back up to seventy-two thousand. But when Longstreet's men left, which is basically a third of his army, one of his three corps, he found himself with just fifty-five thousand men remaining. So he lost quite a bit. As I said, Meade wanted to chase Lee, mm -hmm. but he's being told to cool his jets by the powers that be in Washington, especially one, one Henry Hallett, Mary, who told me that if he pursued, there was no way he could be reinforced. So yeah. he's telling them in, in, that all this mixed messages, Hallett's telling them just, just kind of cool for a while. Meade had to deal with the fact that he was losing men too. Don't forget, he ends up losing a lot of his men quite a bit anyway to New York City to deal with those draft those draft yeah. riots we talked about. It's cool these episodes all kind of come together, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And he's gonna so lose he's some as well. Um after the Battle of Chickamauga, he's gonna lose Slocum and Howard right. to going right. out to that, the Western Theater. Right. But that's a little bit of time off though. Yeah. We're still we're still in the summertime here. Yeah. So he's for the most part gonna see his guys go up to New York City. He's gonna lose quite a bit. So Meade is going to have to stay put north of the, of the Rappahannock River for about six weeks. And at, around this time, Washington is kind of trying to decide what the hell to do with Meade and his army. While this downtime is happening, you know, the personalities of George Meade, Henry Halleck, and Abraham Lincoln, they're all starting to clash at this point. Mm -hmm. Because they're trying to figure out the White House is still, you know, harboring a little bit of ill will maybe towards Meade for letting Very unfairly. escape over, over Williamsport, right? Exactly. And, you know, so for the most part, he's trying to figure out, Meade is, you know, am I the right guy for this job? I don't know what the hell's going on with this. Well, I, I don't blame him for that because you look at the, the AOP since, like, you know, since McClellan left, they've had Burnside, they've had Hooker, and now they've got Meade in. And Meade is probably wondering, like, oh, wow, I've been in this since, like, late, late, late June, and it's starting to get on now, and I haven't... You know they're not up. They're not happy with with Gettysburg. Like when am I going to be ousted? Kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Now in this area of Warrington, you know Meade has has been using a railroad, the Orange and Alexandria mm -hmm. Railroad, as his supply line as well as his avenue south. And Meade wanted to kind of abandon it because for one, you know it had no real strategic value. It cost him five thousand guys to guard us, you know, between War the War uh, Warrington and the Potomac. So he's mm -hmm. he wants to kind of go off the off the rails literally here, but Lincoln's going to feel otherwise because Lincoln he wants me to kind of stay anchored on that railroad track because he knows that um that if he's going to hit me hit Lee again he's going to have to use that trail. He also yeah. knows that Lee is likely along the railroad, so he wants to be able to go down because he still wants to go take care of Lee. And this debate is going to go on for the most part through the summer of 1863. What to do? What you know? What's Lee going to do? What you know? What was the story? Um, Lee is sitting behind the Rapidan, and he's also trying to formulate a game plan. There, he's not sitting around deciding either what to, idly what to do. He wants to do yeah. something as well. He knows Longstreet's gone, but he also wants to maintain the initiative. Okay, and what he wants to do, he wants to find a way to strike Meade, but he's concerned. That he lost his first core. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, how the how the hell can I do this? I I want to do it, but I've lost a lot of guys. I lost my most senior core commander, but I don't want to lose the initiative and don't want to give it to me. So for the most part, despite this sudden troop disadvantage, he isn't too concerned about being attacked. In between him and Meade is going to be the town of Culpeper. Yep. And for the most part, it's a great buffer. It offers protection between the both armies. So if Meade's going to come, he's going to see him. Lee's going to see him coming for a mile. So he, so he's not too too concerned about it. Around now, Lincoln is going to get a report that Longstreet is, you know, maybe on, has this on September thirteenth. He's going to mm -hmm. hear that rumors that Longstreet has vacated the dance floor. Yeah, and so he's going to sit there and say, you know, George, why don't you find out if this is true or not? 
So he's going to order George Meade to send his cavalry under Alfred Pleasanton to go to Culpeper and see what's afoot at the Circle K. Right? He wants <laughs> yeah. just to go see if this is true. Two things are going to happen here, right? Pleasanton, on his way, is going to bump into Jeb Stewart, yeah. his cavalry south of the Rapidan, and he will and he will verify, yes, in fact, Longstreet is gone. They, that that's how they're going to do it. The, his first corps is gone. Longstreet's out. So Pleasanton's cavalry is going to get confirmation on that. Um, so now he knows that you know me knows that Lee has less men now, and mm-hmm. he does. <clears throat> but he also here's the thing: <clears throat> he has no idea what Lee's doing, and this is going to haunt him for the next few months. Now he knows Lee's lost a lot of guys. Yeah, but he knows Lee's personality and how what he wants to do, and he can't figure out. Is he planning on attacking? Is he is he planning on falling back for the winter? This is going to be in Meade's head for a while. And this is going to be a good psychological warfare yeah. that Lee is going to play on Meade, right? Knowing he has more men and probably wanting to show Lincoln that he basically still wants to attack on September 16th, Meade is going to move his army into, an, into Culpeper. The area where he's going to move is going to be called the Culpeper V. Okay, mm-hmm. it's also called the Iron Triangle. Okay, and, and the reason why they call that is because it's it's it basically it's surrounded by the Rappahannock River at a point where it intersects the Rapidan. Yeah, and also the Blue Ridge Mountains are going to be on your right. Mm-hmm. So it, it looks like a V. It, it, it yeah. just does, right? But the problem is it's very unstable because if you're going to be attacked and you need to retreat, you're going to have to deal with rivers or, and or a mountain range. So it's not a place to sit idly by. No, but he's going to move there anyway. But he also knows that it, that he's in a prime position to launch an offensive from there if he wants to. The problem he's getting no clear direction from Lincoln on what to do with this. So he's like, "Well, I'm going to move down and put myself in position to attack if we're going to attack." Mm-hmm. But every day I'm here, I'm I'm being threatened by if I'm attacked, I'm in a bad spot. Right? Yeah. So around September 18th or 19th, Mary, Meade is going to use this time to send his cavalry again to recon that area. And this time what he's going to do is this is right around exactly when the Battle of Chickamauga is going. Yeah, I was going to say it's exactly like, you know, there's lots of stuff going on in the Western theater. Right. So Meade, you know, his numeric superiority is is going to change here. You kind of alluded to it a little while ago. So what's going to happen? Uh, so after the Battle of Chickamauga, um, Rosecrans is going to be in a position where he could be sieged by Bragg. So they take um, the a lot of the 11th Corps, uh, not all of them. Uh, a lot of them are going to go to the Western Theater with Howard, and Slocum is going to go as well. And so is Hooker. So the three of them are going to go out to the Western Theater. So that is a loss for Meade right there. And they're going out there just to reinforce rosecrans and help him out and help break the cracker line as well and you're also going to have sherman coming down from vicksburg as well right and so for purposes of what we're talking about here Meade's going to lose most of his 11th corps including the the man with the rock hard abs and the oh, manly God. face general howard is going to be the one hard man he's, he's also going to general lose, he's also going to lose henry slocum and they're going to go out to chattanooga okay and lincoln the reason why is lincoln lincoln's under the impression I mean, obviously, he wants to help out Rosecrans, but he's also under the impression that Meade's army is too big to sit around idly mm-hmm. on defense. It's just, it's just too big. So what's going to happen is 13,100 men are going to be sent west, to, but they're going to be offset, though, by the arrival of around 9,000 returnees coming back from New York from the draft riots. So it's still going to be a negative, it's still going to be a 4,000-person differential. But Meade still got eighty eight thousand guys after yeah. the eleventh and twelfth go. So he's still got a bunch of he's still got a bunch of people. But Meade though, he sees this transference of these two corps out west is an indication that maybe you know um, Lincoln kind of wants him to kind of stay where he's at. He just wants to just just you know just just stay with you where you are with that right. But he's also thinking maybe he wants me to go on the offensive. Maybe he's saying that I have too many men for defense, but maybe I need to yeah. use what I have to go on the offensive. But there's all these mixed messages that Meade is getting. It's not going to be long until Robert E. Lee finds out, Mary, that all those 13,100 troops got sent. He's going to find out himself. Also throw in the fact that Lee knows that this army 
that's still sitting there with me, these 88,000 men, is not is not his father's Gettysburg Army. No. This is a different army of, of the Potomac. What's going to happen is obviously there's a lot of senior leadership changes. The yeah. first corps is now controlled by John Newton. The second corps is temporarily commanded by Governor Kimball Warren. Yeah. Because um because Hancock got injured at Gettysburg, yeah. obviously, yeah. right? Um, the remains of that third corps that got destroyed at Gettysburg, Sickles Old Corps, is going to be commanded by the perma blinking William French. He's going to be blinking. there. And George Sykes is still going to command the fifth. Yep. And John Sedgwick is still going to command the sixth. So you see a lot of inexperience now in, in the in the upper yep. levels of the Army of the Potomac. And yep. Lee knows it. So he basically is thinking, well, there might be an opportunity here. Yeah. But he's what, just as broke. He's just in bro- as broken in some ways as well, too, because you have, you know, pickets um, getting destroyed at pickets charge. Mm-hmm. Um, you have all those officers that are taken. They're either killed or they're wounded. You know, he's lost men like Isaac Trimble as well, who's um, in prison camp at this time, I believe. And, you know, he's I think Lee is just, a, you know, he they're kind of in. Um, like they're very similar right now in what they're going through, I think. No, he is, but he also knows that this is as close to numbers as he's been yep. in a while. Yes. And he, he knows what he has. So he's thinking, I don't have this gigantic numerical dis- disadvantage. It's and I'm still I'm still shorthanded, mm-hmm. but it's closer than it's been. You mentioned injuries. Wade Hampton's also injured. Yeah. He took a sword to the noggin at East Calvary Field mm-hmm. in Gettysburg. So Jeb Stewart is commanding not only the Corps, he's also commanding Hampton's division. And that's going to yeah. cause problems too. He's also going to fit you, fit you Lee as well. But what's going to happen is he's going to be set up, Lee is, along the Rapidan. and he's going to have Jeb Stewart covering his left flank and Fitz mm-hmm. Lee covering his right flank. He's going to basically have AP Hill's three divisions lined up on his rebel left and Richard Ewell on his right. And this is the, this is how it's going to look on October seventh, October eighth. Now, the reason I would talk about all this, and we're going to get to Bristol Station, I promise, is because there's a setup to this, and there's a reason why these 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 army, these machinations, how they move and get to where they're going to go, mm-hmm. and it's a fascinating cat and mouse story between Lee and Meade. Okay, so Lee is going to begin to move them. He is going to slowly start to mass them on the rebel left. Okay, because he knows that Meade is in the Culpeper V. Yeah. He knows it's in a vulnerable position, and he knows the numbers are closer. So he's thinking this might be a chance to go and get him, right? Now, in the movie Independence Day, Mary, you ever seen that movie Independence Day? Yes, I love Jeff that Gold, movie. Goldblum talks about how the aliens are moving the chess pieces around, and then when yeah. they get in position, then they attack and take the queen, right? Now, I don't know yeah. if Meade saw the movie or not, but if he did, <laughs> he would know that this was Lee. This is what Lee was doing. Yeah. He was moving the chess pieces around, getting ready to attack. And that's exactly what he's going to do. Now, Meade, he knows the Confederates are moving. He knows it for two reasons. First, his intelligence has cracked the signal code for the, for the flag guys yeah. in the signal stations. He knows he and also the Richmond newspapers are detailing Lee's movements in the newspaper. They're reporting yeah. it. And so he just picks up the damn paper and he goes online. I don't know what he yeah. does. But he got a subscription. He, he sees almost in real time that Lee's moving. Now here's the thing, though. You know, the question of what is Lee up to is what was keeping Meade up at night. Mm-hmm. And this is first and first and in, in center in his head. And he knows it's got to be. It has to be one of three things. Lee's means thinking. Lee's got to be doing one of these three things. He's going to try to swing around my right. To get between me and Washington, which is yeah. the, the second Manassas game plan. Oh, this that that's Lee's playbook. Is his old chestnut dusted off? He's thinking he's he, he might be doing that. He's also thinking he could be preparing to hit me right in the Culpeper V, right on. <laughs> okay. The third thing is that he's setting up for a retreat back over the Rapidan. Yeah. So he knows it's one of those three, but he doesn't know what. But he does know this. The worst scenario is the third one. Because if he's sitting back wondering what Lee's going to do, mm-hmm. and Lee sneaks over and takes off and goes away, he knows he's getting fired. Yeah. You know, he has to. Well, that's, that a, would be... that's the thing is I think he he's beginning to think, I'm on borrowed time because the the two guys that, like before me, uh, Burnside and Hooker, like they're not in there for very long and he's starting to get to that mark where it's like oh what's gonna happen 
to me. Well, think about it. You move you move into a position that's designed to attack offensively. Yeah. And you're on all of a sudden you see you see Lee moving and you don't do anything and he just walks away. Yeah. I mean that that that's what he Well, it's basically he would get accused of doing what McClellan did, right? Yeah. Exactly. But but so this is what's going on in his head. And it's a tough tough situation for the old turtle, the old snapping turtle, Mary, yeah. because he does because it's kind of it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because mm-hmm. none of those three choices is a good is a good position if you're sitting on defense in yeah. a very vulnerable place, right? Mead's gonna do what is he gonna do? He's gonna do both here. He's gonna respond offensively and defensively. He's gonna keep most of his army where they are in that iron triangle that call Pepper V. But he's going to send John Buford's cavalry, uh, along with um, along with some infantry from the Fifth and Sixth Corps, around the Rebel right to try to attack him, to try to see what's going on, right? And this is going to lead to a comedy of errors of communication. Me thinks Buford's going to leave on, on um, is going to basically leave on the tenth of October, yeah. And he, he's going to be leaving around eleven p.m. That's what the orders are, and he never gets the orders on time, so it, it all gets completely screwed up. He's also going to send Judson Kilpatrick on a fun run around the rebel <laughs> left. Yeah. And he, he will, cause he's looking for Lee's infantry at this point. He's I'm going to send these cavalry guys out to go, to go free and find them. And what's going to happen is he's not going to find them. He's going to look and he can't uh, kill Patrick's going to run into Stuart and, and Fitzhugh Lee at a place called James city, Virginia. And they're going to skirmish back and forth. And they're going to do cavalry fighting in the usual, right? At this point, Mead, he he hasn't he can't find Lee. He hasn't heard a word from Buford because Buford ends up fighting for his life at a play at, at the Battle of Mort's Ford. Yeah, because he's going to end up running into cavalry as well. But he's pretty convinced at this point by seeing the cavalry where they are, the Confederates, that Lee's probably not retreating, and he's likely in the early stages of an offensive. Mm-hmm. That's what Mead's thinking. He's like, okay, so for this reason. He realizes he's in a vulnerable spot. He's going to call back Buford in that fifth and sixth corps, and he's going to begin his. Uh, he's going to begin to pull his army back to Culpeper Courthouse as soon as possible. And once they get there, he says, "This is not the place to be. We need to move out of this Culpeper yeah. V." So on the eleventh of October, he issues General Order GTFO from the Culpeper <laughs> V. Right, because he knows, you no, know, because if this guy's on an offensive, this is not right where I want to be. He's going to head north along the Rappahannock, and he's going to set up a defensive line, and they're going to get there on the 12th of October. Okay, mm-hmm. On the Rebel side, what's going on over there? Jeb Stewart is going to ride into the Culpeper Courthouse on the 11th, ahead of Lee's infantry, to ride north to the town. And he's going to, it's going to end up in this dramatic chase where you're going to have four cavalry divisions yeah. all running, going full speed. Because Kilpatrick and Buford are going, they're going to go past the old Brandy Station battlefield mm-hmm. north of Culver Courthouse, and they're all they're all moving at this point. So on October twelfth, George Meade and his infantry are there, set up in a defensive position on the banks of the Rappahannock, but he's still unsure what Lee's attack plans are. He can't find the Rebel infantry thanks to Stuart's cavalry primarily, but Meade's nervous now because he's starting to wonder. If all this movement, all these movements are, are are just a big ruse by Lee, right? Have you ever have you ever seen the um that meme with um with the Undertaker, the wrestler? Yep. And he's laughing, and the Undertaker shows up behind him. Yep. That's kind of what's going to happen with this with this whole thing, because when at, at the end of the day, Lee's going to get right behind him, and he's not even going to know it. Yeah. But but the thing about it is, Washington is going to get word now that Lee. I mean that Meade has pulled out of Culpeper, and they are pissed off because you you left this area without a fight, it just mm-hmm. just left it, and for the most part, because they he hears that Lee is pulled out. Washington hears that Lee is pulled out of his defensive position along the river, so they've drawn him out. But instead of going to attack him, Meade backs off. Yeah, and Lincoln, the guy with the hat, Mary, he ain't <laughs> having it. They did not have it, so. Meade knows he has to act, and he does for the most part. So on the twelfth, he's going to begin. He's going to send Buford again with those fifth and sixth corps, mm. along with the, some second corps troops, all under this under the command of John Sedgwick in the sixth corps. This is going to be close to half of his entire army, and he's going to send them back south across the Rappahannock mm-hmm. to see if Lee's still there. Oh, and by the way, if you're there, you want to fight. You want to fight? 
We're, we're going to come find you. Right. So they're going to march down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, that lifeline we talked about, yeah. to get back into Culpeper. Okay. And they're they're waiting because they're they're pretty sure that Lee's in Culpeper now. So Buford gets down there, and he gets he gets a message back, and it says, "Um, hey George, guess what? There's no Rebs here." Yeah. And so Meade's like, Mead, you got to think this for a second. He was positive that's where they were, but now he absolutely has no idea where Lee is. While he's doing this big movement across the Rappahannock, Lee is actually crossing the Rappahannock beyond Meade's right flank. Yeah. And what, who's going to find him finally is Dave McMurtry Gregg, the hero of oh, Gettysburg. DMG. Third, right? yeah. Run DMG. He's going to find Richard Yule's Corps near the town of Jefferson, uh, Virginia. So Lee is going to get word basically about 9 p.m. on 10-12, uh, that meat is rather that Lee's close and he's going to sit there and he's going to have a true pucker effect moment because he's yeah. going to realize at this moment, here's where the, the undertaker meme comes in. He realizes that Lee's army is behind him on his right and half of his army is across the river looking yeah. for him in an empty field. So he's vulnerable. now. So, so George he's Meade, kind of divided his force the way like, this is what Rosecrans does leading into Chickamauga is he's got, Pretty well, much. he hasn't really divided his force. It's really spread out, but Meade, like, I mean, dividing your force is risky. Now Lee has done it. He did that Chancellorsville and it was successful, but like, this is like, for me, this is, I mean, I can't imagine the pressure he's feeling with like, if this goes wrong, I'm gone, I'm fired. Yeah. And who knows what's going to happen to me kind of thing. So Meade pulls out of the Culpeper V because he feels that position is vulnerable, okay? But somehow he put himself in a worse position by overthinking Lee's intentions. Mm -hmm. Somehow Lee played Meade to be a fool without even trying because Meade, this was how much Lee was in Meade's head at this point. So Meade knows now he's got to react quickly because now he knows he really is in trouble. He knows he's not retreating. He's on his right flank. He's behind him. And half of his army is across the river. So he's, oh, crap, you've got to be kidding me. So what's going to happen? He's going to order his troops northward now along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad to get the hell out of Dodge. We just, we got to get out of here, right? Mm -hmm. Naturally, there's more problems for me because it's, it's just picture goes on and on and on. He runs into a problem. And the problem is 1,200 reserve supply wagons that are on his, in his way. And they are clogging the f up out of the railroad <laughs> picture 1200 wagons That's so lot. you're trying to march now the, the, the army's not in trains they're they're marching mm -hmm. along the railroad they need to get out of here quickly and you you end up with a traffic jam like store or drive on a friday in boston all of a sudden because you're trying to send your army up you know that you're calling yeah. back the rest of the army and you're trying to send the rest of your army north but as you start going you have 1,200 wagons just sitting there, right? So what's going to basically happen is it, it, to clear up this gridlock, Meade's going to split up his army again. And he's going to send a second and third corps. This is under Warren and, yeah. and Blinky and, and French, Blinky. along with along with Greg's cavalry and Kilpatrick's yeah. cavalry to go around to the west on an alternate route towards the town of Auburn, Virginia. And while the rest of the army is going to follow those supply wagons mm -hmm. and march up the train tracks. So that's that's what it's going to be. It's going to be a two-pronged parallel line marching north with the ultimate goal to get to Centerville, not yep. far from Manassas, where there's more defenses. And that's the place they're going to go. Now, Lee, he has supply problems himself at this point. Okay, At this point of the year, this is two years in now, this point of the war, rather, Northern Virginia is a wasteland. Yeah. So he wants to go move quickly, too, because he wants to get around Meade and get between him. But he has to sit and wait for his supply wagons to catch up with his army because they're they're in the back. Well, he's got all those grocers on that big shopping trip into uh Tell me about it. The ho-hos and everything. In the, the they had to, they had, the they had to do that. <laughs> no DQ, though. No, no, absolutely not. So Lee has to stop now. And by stopping, he's unwittingly knowing, uh, unknowing rather, that Meade is moving and, and the advantage he had of being around him, he's gonna he's gonna kind of start to slip on right by. So during you know during early on October 13th, okay, Jeb Stewart, he's sitting there waiting for the wagons. 
he wants to kind of go go east and he wants to go check out the union what they're doing on those train tracks yeah. he wants to go scout them out a little bit so they're sitting around he's like okay you know just go over there and go find out and what's going to happen is is he's going to he's going to basically start to move and when he does he what's going to happen is he doesn't realize that the second and third corps is coming and so when he goes and he crosses to go towards the railroad he's going to end up between two mar- armies marching northeast and he can't get back he's going to be mm-hmm. stuck in the middle he's going to be malcolm in the middle right he's, you know, <laughs> he won't be able to go anywhere so what's going to happen is he's going to end up um, he's going to end up going to, to basically see what the situation is and he's going to leave Lunsford Lomax behind uh, to go see what, to see what the deal is. And he's going to leave him back in the, that town of Auburn to basically cover his rear. Now, while, while Jeb is doing his recon, he's going to the train track, he's, he's seeing the army. What does yeah. he see? He sees those 12,000, those 1200 yeah. wagons. And he's going to basically see them all. And his eyes are going to turn into saucers because he knows there's nothing to eat in the area. We're waiting yeah. for wagons. This 1,200 probably ho-hos in there <laughs> waiting waiting to get these. Yeah. And they said that there was that they were all sitting in a field. There was yeah. so many with white tops that looked like snow. Yeah. That's what he said. Well, and then do, doesn't he see like Union soldiers lounging around as well? Just yeah, he sees them all hanging out. They're all like, yeah. And so, but he sees that, you know, he knows Lee's waiting for supplies. So he hasn't, he thinks it's an opportunity to bag these supplies. He's going to send a message back to Lee. He's like, why don't we send some troops over here? We'll go get this mm-hmm. stuff. But what's going to happen is, you know, there's the Union Third Corps under French. They're going to begin to approach Auburn, just like I said, and they're going to run into Lomax. And Lomax is going to immediately fall back and he's going to tell Jeb, hey, we're cut off. We got Union troops going northeast to our, mm-hmm. to our east and northeast to our west. And we're in the middle with two lines going up and we're stuck, just like I said, right in the middle. So what, what's Jem going to have to do? They're going to have to hide in the woods overnight. They're oh, going to have to take us in. And they're going to sit in the woods. And you can only imagine how, how, how much fun that must have been, keeping horses quiet. Because yeah. you were, nope. you get caught, you were, you were screwed. Yeah. You absolutely were. Yeah. He's going to try to send them a message back to Lee to get through that line, saying, hey, listen, um, if you send infantry and you hit this marching line, from the west i can do it from the east and we can at least mess stuff up a little bit mm-hmm. um but lee doesn't want to do it because he wants to keep his army moving so that's that's not going to happen but he also doesn't want to leave jeb behind he doesn't want to leave, him, leave yeah. him behind so because he's in but he's wondering if up to this point he hasn't heard from jeb because he can't get the messages through yeah he's, he's having deja vu all over again where the hell's jeb stewart of gettysburg yeah the exactly. flashbacks and so he's like, so he's worried. And then he finds out this finds out the deal of what he's gonna do. Okay. Um, Lee did get that second message, but he like I said, he doesn't want to go fight, he, he but he can't leave him alone. So what's gonna happen is he's gonna send Richard Yule, his second corps, into Auburn, a portion of it to go bail him out. Let's just go get him, we'll fight because we mm-hmm. have we have no we have no choice. So on dawn on October 14th, Yule and AP Hill, they're about six miles apart. While well, French's Third Corps, they're going to pass through Auburn, and, he, and they're going to arrive in in a place called Greenwich, Virginia. That doesn't really matter, but they're but they're on they're on the way to Bristow. Yeah. Okay. Most of the Union Army is is east now, marching northeast on the railroad, heading through Bristow Station on the way to Centerville, which was like I said was going to be their final destination. Right. Governor Kimball Warren, his Second Corps, he's going to be with David McMurtry, Greg's Cavalry his division and they're going to be camped about a mile south of auburn but instead of following french around the west towards greenwich they're going to stay in auburn to deal with yule because they know yule's there now so yep. they're gonna to have to fight him and but then they know they can't fight him long because they just they just can't so they're going to eventually know they're going to have to move east and hook up with the railroad again so no longer they're mm-hmm. going to be with the third corps marching around the west they're going to, have to be with the other armies on the railroad and Fall in the north rest of the army. This is going to lead to the Battle of Auburn. You know, it, this is just a small little battle, on October fourteenth, where Jeb Stewart is going to attack John Caldwell's division as he approached Jed's hiding space, his tree fort in the woods. They get close. Tree Jeb's, fort. I just pictured that yeah, tree fort. You know, but what's going to happen is Jeb is going to open up on the on Caldwell yeah. with artillery. 
Caldwell's army is going to be sitting, is going to be early in the morning. They're going to be sitting on a hill boiling coffee. coffee when all of a sudden hill. they're going to get it, they're going to get attacked. And yeah. it's going to be called Coffee Hill because, and it still is today, because that's what they, from this battle. Yeah. It's going to end up killing about 30 guys. Now, Ewell is going to end up deploying his corps um, after Jeb exposed his position because he knows he has to make a run for it. Jeb is actually going to escape from Alexander Hayes' division yep. thanks to the 1st North Carolina Cavalry Regiment, who basically sacrificed themselves so Jeb can get away. Thank you for nothing, by the way. <laughs> but Jeb was supposed to stay to support Yule in, in Hill's Corps. But what, what happens is after he escapes, he thinks he's following Yule's infantry, but he's actually following some sharpshooters, and he ends up going the wrong way, and he's kind of out of it for the rest of, yeah. rest of the day. And that's, that's what's going to happen. But before Yule, his men get fully online in Auburn, Warren knows, like I said, he knows he can't stay. He's going to basically pack his pack up the car. Let's get the hell out of here quickly. Mm -hmm. They fought a little bit, but they had to go. Let's move east of the railroad quick, hook up with the army, and get going. Warren, his quote, he says, To halt there was to await annihilation, and to move as prescribed, carried me along routes in a valley commanded by heights on each side. So Warren knows he has to get out of there quick because he's in a vulnerable position. Now, another reason why Warren wants to move is because Meade left very specific orders with his corps commanders that he wanted them to stay relatively close enough to support each other. He didn't want them all spread out yeah. to, get, to get beaten piecemeal. So what's going to happen is he's going to end up moving and he's going to basically wants to be able to offer support to, 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 these, to these other corps, kind of what he does. The second corps under Warren is now the rear guard of the army. So everything's all mixed up. Mm -hmm. he, the, he's basically the caboose, if you will, of the army <laughs> of the Potomac, right? <laughs> there you go. So Ewell's going to end up with a drawing. He's going to go back. He's going to follow E.P. Hill. And they're going to continue marching north as well to get around Meade's right flank. And these armies are all moving again. So we get to 2 p.m. now, October 14th. A.P. Hill is going to arrive at a place called Bristow Station, Okay. Mm -hmm. And with his division of Harry Heath in the lead. Now, um, they're going to get there. And Hill is going to be standing on a hill. So that's five times. Close, right? <laughs> and they're going to be overlooking an open field leading to some train tracks of the yeah. Orange and Alexandria Railroad at Bristow Station. Okay. Um, if you've been there before, it, Bristow Station is basically just southeast of Manassas. Um, is about 10 miles from Meade's target in Centerville, which he wants to go. Yeah. So if Meade, Lee knows, if I'm going to hit Meade, because I just wanted to do some damage to this guy, this is probably one of my last chances to do it. Yeah. Because because the, the, you know, the door's closing, right? The railroad tracks, if and they're still the same way today, although not as tall, is uh, it runs on top of an, an embankment. So it creates a natural cover for anyone hiding behind. Um, so, but what Hill sees, and this is, this is, Hill makes a lot of mistakes with this. Nice Talker. to see Hill in a battle. In a battle, by the way. Since he's I know. Lying. I was just. A, I was actually gonna when I was, um, you know, kind of studying this battle. I was like, "Wow, is Hill actually here?" Because well, he's here already. He's got a thing of like, you know, calling in sick. <laughs> what Hill's gonna see is he sees. Um, he looks across and he sees the fifth corps or George Sykes, old party mm -hmm. George. Okay, he's gonna be sitting there nearby across a stream called Broad Run. Sykes was moving north from the railroad, and he was kind of sitting there waiting, and he presented a perfect target for Hill. Now, Sykes, for the most part, he, like I said, he's positioned there, and he's waiting for Warren. And what he doesn't know is Warren was engaged at Auburn. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't know where the hell Warren is. But he doesn't – George Sykes is not like sitting there where he is. He just doesn't – he doesn't like the area. Who the hell knows? But he's, uh, he's told to wait. By me for Warren. You don't as soon as you start to see them coming, you can go, but do not go until then. Because he doesn't want to form a gap between the two mm -hmm. because he knows the Confederate army's nearby and he doesn't want to he doesn't get a core destroyed. But Sykes is getting impatient. He doesn't want to wait anymore. He's getting pissy, kind of like you are, you know, waiting we have the bar to open at seven o'clock in the morning, right? What? And so, so he he knows. So basically, Sykes is gonna message Warren. Basically, where the hell are you? Hurry up. I want to get out of here. You know, you're, 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 yeah. My shift ends. You're replacing me. I got to go. It's kind of just kind of just like that. And this is going to cause a huge issue for them afterwards, by the way. Talk briefly about that. Yeah. 
Sykes looks down the train in trail tracks and he sees the early advanced scouting guard of Warren's second corps coming. And he goes, well, good enough for me. Let's go boys. <laughs> Roll them up. We're out of here. Yep. Right. But what he doesn't know is the second course still a few miles away, mm-hmm. but he sees the, he sees the very earth first ray of sunshine. He thinks it's noontime. It's time to go. Let's get the hell yep. out of here. Right. Um, and that's going to be a huge problem. And, an angry soldier in the second corps after the battle is a great quote about this. He says, Sykes was told the second corps was coming and indeed it was, as was Christmas. That's what he said. Oh my God. And it caused him leaving caused a <laughs> lot of problems and it pissed a lot of people off. What Sykes was doing, he was about to hang Warren and the second corps out to dry mm-hmm. and leaving no support. For one time, Tardy George was in a hurry. He, he yep. wanted to go, and it, 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 it's after it's a big reason why he got replaced by Warren after, later on. You know, the official reason was he was he got sciatica and he physically couldn't go anymore. Oh, sciatica was, is very painful. But this was Sykes' last hurrah. They, they were yep. done with him after this, the, 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 as far as that goes. So when he when Hill sees the Fifth Corps starting to move, he thinks the Fifth Corps is the caboose and not the Second Corps. For whatever reason, yeah. Hill says, that's the back of the Union Army. I want to hit them as they're going up the railroad. He wants okay? to hit that? He wants to hit that Savannah H- hard. Okay? Hill's, Hill's done that now, a few times in his life. Now, not, not to give away the story here, but if you're going to hit the Fifth Corps in the rear, and that's the end, that's a good plan. Unless yep. there's a whole corps coming up behind you you don't know about. There's a whole and that's whole why the Battle of Bristol here. Station is also known as Hill's Folly, because this is this is not a good day for him, yeah. right? So that what's going to happen is he's 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 basically going to find out he has no Sykes has no idea, like I said about the bat about the Battle of Auburn, but he's but he's delayed. He's he's going to go, and um, neither does Hill for the most part. He doesn't know either, but he was sure that Sykes was the end. He was, that was the last train. This is going to be my chance. He's going to send in Heath's division, okay, two gigantic North Carolina uh, uh, regiments of 4,000 men under William Kirkland mm-hmm. and John Cook, okay? He's also going to set up artillery under a guy named William Polk. And what he wants to do is he wants to hit the withdrawing Fifth Corps. This is this is my chance to go get it, yeah. right? Um, the other miss that Hill is going to have is going to be the arrival of that of the real vanguard of the second corps. And this is going to be under Alexander Webb, who was temporarily in charge of the command because of John Gibbon, Mm -hmm. who he went down to Gettysburg as well. Yeah. He's wounded in Pickett's charge. Yeah. So once Hill attacks, and here's the thing that's amazing with this, once Hill attacks, Sykes could obviously hear the, the, the artillery in his rear. You know what he does? Nothing. He keeps going. I'm not shocked, given what I know about him. But you know what, though? Not all of them, though. You know, basically, you had one division of Pennsylvania men under William yeah. McCandless, who was on Little Round Top at Gettysburg on the, mm. on the, uh, the north slope of it. He decides to stay and fight. So McCandless's men are going to fight while the rest of the Fifth Corps is oh, oh, hiring it up the railroad track. <laughs> is how it's, how it's going to go, right? You know, Cook and, and Kirkland's Confederate, they're going to be, you know, the North Carolinians, Carolinians rather. They're going to, remember I mentioned that that Hill said there was that big open field between what he saw and the tracks. Yeah. That's where Cook and Kirkland are going to march across oh, okay. open field. And if you go to Bristow Station uh, and you stand on the top of the hill and you look down, you can still see the field. And it's, it's, it's almost the same for the most part. The, um, uh, the, the the battlefield trust the, the Bristow Heritage people yeah. uh, have done a good job maintaining it for the most part. Well, what's going to happen is they're going to begin to move across, and what happens is when Webb's division arrives, this is going to be this is going to be brigades commanded by Francis Heath's men. Okay, headlined by those hard fighting Gettysburg regiments, First yeah. Minnesota, Nineteenth Maine, Fifteenth Mass, Eighty Second New York. These are battle tested guys. Mm-hmm. Warren is going to see this. He's going to personally line up his division behind that railroad track and that embankment. And they're going to be right. He's going to set up those guys right next to Jay Mallon's men. Uh, of his, his old 42nd New York, the 19th, the 20th Massachusetts, you know, the 7th Michigan and the 59th New York. Okay. Now these are all, like I said, these are battle tested guys. 
Warren is an engineer by trade, right? Mm-hmm. He's also going to set up artillery under William Arnold's first Rhode Island Light Artillery. Uh, Ricketts is going to send his first Pennsylvania. Nelson Ames, first New York. Uh, they're going to set up on high ground behind this railroad track. Yeah. So what you have basically is infantry lined up behind an embankment and a really good natural cover with a high ground behind with artillery set up. Okay. And when Alexander, basically he's going to set up 50, I think it's 16 total guns that Warren's going to set up. He's a really good defensive position to go here, right? When Alexander Hayes' division arrives, because now you have the, the second corps arriving now, they're going to basically be deployed by Warren. They're going to be they're going to be right behind the railroad track on Webb's left. Mm-hmm. So GK Warren is going to have eighty three hundred men lined up in, in this defensive position. Wow. He's still under he's still under man though. Okay, yeah. It's going to lead to a thirty minute engagement that's going to be known later on as the Battle of Bristow Station. Okay. Um, now the thing about it though, when you, when you're looking at the actual battle. You've got those two huge North Carolina brigades coming down, yeah. um, Cook and Kirkland, right? And they kind of make a half-assed attack at first because they think yeah. they're attacking retreating Fifth Corps guys. So they're kind of swinging around like towards their left a little bit because um, they figure that's that's where they were going. Yeah. Once Warren's men showed themselves uh, and started firing, the, a lot of these North Carolinians were cut to ribbons almost immediately. Yeah. Cook, Cook is going to get hit in the leg. He's going to go down. Kirkland's going to get shot as well. And they realize that they've got themselves a battle here. Yeah. Right. And so Heath, the division commander at this point, you know, he, he got his dander up. He decides <laughs> he wants to, he's going to push all his ships to the table and he's going to go all in. Now. Yeah. He sees, he sees the union there. They know they want to fight. And so he's going to set up seven guns under a guy named David McIntosh mm-hmm. to fire down, but they're setting up guns under fire. So it's it's just the yeah. Whole thing and then is don't the union the, the union responds right away, right? Like they're like, "Well, you're doing this, we're going to do it right back to you." Well, here here's the here's the folly I mentioned before. For whatever reason, Hill never reconned. Now Jeb Stewart's no. gone. He's chase he's chasing butterflies with the sharpshooters heading the wrong way in the railroad track. But he doesn't know the second corps is coming, and he should know better than that. Admittedly, he's a he's a battle tested guy. Well, you he think yo- he would have? You think he would have learned? And I mean, I know Lee is not very happy with Hill after this battle at all, to the point where he's like, "Say no more about it." So that he's gonna, he, he's that pretty much tells you all, all you need to know about how Lee feels about this. Well, I mean, some some of these red, these North Carolina, twenty seventh North Carolina, yeah, sixty eight percent, sixty eight percent casualties. These that, are guys that, that like Pettigrew's guys are there, and they lost a lot. The twenty sixth North Carolina, they're there too, right? And they lost a lot of guys. Twenty sixth North Carolina, they're they are going to be there. They're from yeah. Pearson Ridge at Gettysburg. They were one of the only ones that broke the Union line for a little bit of time. Yeah, you know, they they got through to the right side of the Union line and hit that third brigade in Webb's division. Um, Brigadier General James Mallon. Okay, mm-hmm. he he was in charge of the 49th New York. He's an ancestor of the actor Brian Mallon. Speaking yep. of Gettysburg movie, he's going to be killed here. James Mallon's wow. going to go down here, right? Um, Irish guy, and mm-hmm. for the most part, um, what's what's going to basically happen is. Is the Union troops for the most part are going to are going to start to move get offensive now? They're going to move into this field. They see these Carolinians drawing a little bit, falling back. They're going to move forward. Now this is all going on while Macintosh is trying to set up his guns. And there's that old story where somehow Macintosh lost his guns to a retreating army. That, that, that story kind of got around. But they're going to begin to move forward. And what's going to happen for the most part is um. It's going to get late in the day now. Darkness is going to start to fall. And so this is going to end up being a huge advantage for Warren. Okay. Because at this point, Richard Anderson's division is showing up now. So there's more and more Confederates coming onto the dance floor with this. Um, so Caldwell's going to show up as well. So you're going to have the full second core, but you're almost going to have, for the most part, the entire second core, the, kind of the Confederate second core and the third yeah. core all arriving kind of all at the same time. And then to make it even worse for, for Warren, guess what shows up again? Those friggin' wagons. Yep. The 1,200 wagons come rumbling down the road and <laughs> slows everything up again. They have to it's also been raining, so the roads oh, yeah. are really shitty, too, from that. 
So they end up diverting the wagons to get away from the battlefield, okay? Now, Yule, he's going to arrive now right next to Robert E. Lee. The big boss is riding up with him, and he's going to see this whole thing. He's going to look at the field, and he's going to basically say, you know what? This is my chance to bag a big part of Meade's army. It's what yeah. I've wanted. We're going to do it. He's got 40,000 men on the battlefield now, Lee does. Versus 8,300 Union guys. Mm-hmm. So it's lining up for a real bad friggin' day for Mother, for G.K. Warren, okay? And and, and it's just, but what happens is Lee, Yule wants to hit Warren's flank. So what he's going to do, and this, this, is the, this battle is such a hilarious comedy of errors. Yule's mm-hmm. going to order Gordon to, to basically go hit the flank. John Brown Gordon, who's usually really good, yeah. is going to start to go. He's going to see those wagons. And for whatever reason, he chases the wagons. He, that, that's what he does. So now Gordon, because he's gone, he was supposed to be – he was going to be Jubal early support to attack. Now yeah. early can't attack because he has no Gordon because he's chasing the wagons now. So the whole thing's falling apart. You can imagine Lee face palming as this whole thing is yeah. going down. I mean, you're talking like, four to one. I mean, you just you just have it, right? So Lee says, let's just go around, get on the railroad. Don't hit them frontally. Go around them and, and push, kind of hit the railroad like you're rolling up a blanket. Just hit yeah. like Emmitsburg Road at Gettysburg. Fling yeah. around and just hit them and roll them up. That that's what we're gonna do. Okay. And hit them right in the savannah, like we said before. That's what he's gonna try. Yeah. Get the yeah. hit their hit their hit hit the left flank and get them going. Okay. The problem is when they're ready to go, it gets dark. And Lee says, oh God, okay, let's everyone just stop. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's wait until the morning of the 15th. In the morning, we're gonna start. And we're going to send Cook and Kirkland's brigades down there again, and we're going to go around their left flank, and then we're going to attack, and we're going to drive. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Sun comes up the next morning, right? Kirkland and Cook they sneak down there, very, very quiet. Right? <laughs> they're going to go down there, yeah. and they're going to go. They're going to go hit them. They run across the railroad tracks and they charge. Pull out their guns. They aim them, and guess what's there? Nothing. Warren took there. off. Yeah. During the night, Warren took his army and said, let's get out of here. There's a lot of guys out there, a lot of NASCAR fans on the hill up there. We want to <laughs> stick around here, right? So he went, so what he wants to do is he he wants to go up north on follow the rest of the army. He goes, well, you know what? The army is moving ahead. Sykes' fifth corps is way up there now. This is his second battle of the day yeah. for Warren with Auburn and and now Bristol Station. So he's like, the hell with this. So he goes up the tracks. We're just going to go. We're going to catch up to Sykes. We're going to we're going to get out of here. Okay. So they go back and they find out that Lee does that that Warren's gone, mm-hmm. and Robert E. Lee is angrier than a Patriot season ticket holder right now. That's how mad he is, right? Because he knows he missed a chance. Yep. He, and like to you, what you said a little while ago. He is going to be mad at Hill, as he should be. I think everybody's mad at Hill. Like Sandy Pendleton said that Hill is a fool and woeful blunder. Well, Hill, and it all goes back to the fact that he goes and he does all this without checking. He doesn't verify that the fifth core is the is the back. Yep. He doesn't he doesn't know the second core is coming. And he, and he knows it. And also he attacks before the rest of the army is there. He knows yep. Yule's coming, but he sends those two four thousand men initially, Cook and Kirkland, to go hit that what he thought was the retreating Fifth Corps, mm-hmm. and they get stuck and run into a buzzsaw when when Warren's guy. It's a great day for Warren, by the way. Yeah, you no, know? Warren does really well here, and like you know, A. B. Hill, he gets official censure as well. Like Seddon, the sec- the Confederate Secretary of War, said the disaster at Bristol Station seems due to the gallant but over hasty pressing of the enemy. And Jefferson Davis um, was very critical as well, saying that there was a want of vigilance. Yeah. I mean, he just, he, for whatever reason, A.P. Hill did, a, maybe maybe because he felt bad for missing a lot of Gettysburg, who knows why. But I, I full... was thinking that. I like. I was thinking, like, is this somehow some kind of thing where he's like, oh, shit, I can get my redemption here. Like, what we've seen with other battles in the Civil War that we've talked about. Um, is this, like, kind of him, like, taking that risk 
and thinking, okay, if this pays off, it's got huge, like it's going to be huge for me. But as we see, it it doesn't pay off for him. Um, no, and for, for whatever I, reason, he attacks without doing any coordination, any recognizance, reconnaissance. His assault basically was nothing more than a YOLO moment for him. Just yeah. go and attack and go get him with no leadership and absolutely no foresight. Just went yeah. ahead and do it. Now, reportedly, Lee is laying him out and just going on him, right? And mm-hmm. AP Hill kind of drops his head, gets a little sad, you know, just flashes his puppy dog eyes a little bit, mm-hmm. right? And this is when Lee, like you said, collects himself like he does. And, and he says, let us bury these poor men and say no more of it. Heard that in Hill, Machine's voice. Yeah, he, yeah, he does. And he, I mean, Hill's for the most part is, is demasculated here. He, he just is. Yeah, and, I mean, I mean, Hill is kind of, you know, he's kind of a, a funnier figure in the Civil War, but he's also kind of a tragic figure too because he, obviously has a lot of health problems but then when he is healthy here seemingly because he's actually at the battle he just it's such bad luck for him right like so he's kind of one of these more tragic figures in the the confederate army and there's there's a lot of reasons why we talk you know of why he attacks there's rumors that you know Governor Kimball Warren Tim dated the same woman back in the day too, just like McClellan. There's, Seriously, there's, oh, I'm not shocked. That. I'm not shocked you know? about Warren. So, I think Warren so, dated anything that walked. But there's a but there's a lot of animosity with this. Lee yeah. decides for this point, just call off the dogs on the whole thing. You know, and it is pointless. He realized he's got so he's got few supplies. He can't chase meat any further. He he just can't. He's almost in, he's almost heading towards, you know, um Centerville and, and he's getting close to Washington. He says mm-hmm. enough is enough. So he's going to basically, Lee is now to call, fall back towards the Rappahannock River again. Yeah. And it's funny because after the battle, Warren is going to go find Sykes. Where the hell is Sykes? I need to talk to Sykes. I hope he lays and him out for this one. And he does. He flips out on him so badly that even Warren felt bad and apologized later for it. You can only imagine how that conversation must have went. Oh, my God. I mean, because you can't blame him, though. No. But in in the in the end, Warren, who was in temporary command of the second quarter, yeah. like I said, he's going to fight two battles, not one, on that October 14th, the Battle of Auburn, the Battle of Bristol Station. For this, he's going to earn permanent corps command of the Fifth Corps, which is ironically is going to replace George Sykes. Yeah. And you know, once a Winnie boy there comes back to command the second corps after after he got his injury there, right? Yeah. And the thing about it though is Lee knew this in the end. Lee had a great chance, but AP Hill bumbled it all away at Bristol Station. That's why like I said that's why they call it Hill's folly in a lot of cases. Yeah. But it wasn't just Hill's fault. And this is the thing when you look at it, when you're slicing up the blame pie and you're handing out the slices, okay? Yeah. It's not just it's not just Hill. You have to also blame Jeb. Yeah. For 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 chasing for go basically going the wrong direction. Because what happens is because Jeb's not there. Even if Jeb wanted, even if, if Hill wanted to do a reconnaissance, he doesn't have the cavalry to do it. Yeah. So so that gets him as well, too. And for the most part, the, the two armies are still going to kind of skirmish off and on the next couple of yeah. weeks. Jeb is going to feel bad, try to redeem himself by fighting cavalry uh, under Jezical Patrick again on the 19th, which is going to be called the Battle of Buckland Mills, which is just northwest of Bristol Station. So they're still going to be kind of going at each other a little bit. Lee is going to fall back to Kelly's Ford mm-hmm. uh, in near Rappahannock Station. And Meade is actually going to send troops down to try to push him back again because he wants to get him over the Rapidan, right? So he's going to send troops down on November 7th. It's going to, be, it's going to end up being the Battle of Kelly's Ford and Rappahannock Station, mm-hmm. which will ultimately push Lee back all the way to Orange County across the Rapidan when Lee started. And you got to give Meade credit. He's the only guy to do that. The yeah. other guys couldn't, couldn't do that, but he actually yeah. did. Well, Meade doesn't get enough credit as commander of the Army of the Potomac, and I think it's because nobody studies, like, he's most well-known for Gettysburg, obviously, and then he kind of, well, I shouldn't say kind of, he does get overshadowed when Grant um, comes east, and I think this is a part of Meade, Meade, not just Meade's career, but in the Civil War, but um, the post-Gettysburg in the Eastern Theater that doesn't get looked at enough, because it just... It does show that Meade was competent. Yes, he's struggling to figure out what the hell he is doing. But then in the end, as you say, he drives Lee Lee away. No, he does. But the thing, the takeaway from the Battle of Bristol Station and really the Bristol campaign is what ultimately it's called. It's a fascinating study because really it shows how brilliantly Robert E. Lee 
was able to fool Meade. Mm -hmm. But in the end, circumstances and communication issues is going to be the Rebs undoing here. And Lee is going to really miss an opportunity to inflict punishment on, on, our, on Meade's Army of the Potomac, even without his first corps with James Longstreet. He, Lee was that close. And with, with, everything, with everything going on, with armies being moved up and down the train mm -hmm. tracks, with the Battle of Auburn Station, I mean, the Battle of Auburn um, leading to the Battle of Bristol Station, there was so much opportunity. But Lee having to wait for his supplies really doomed them in a lot of different ways. Um, but again, getting to Bristol Station in AP Hill, jumping the gun and hitting Sykes, thinking he was the yeah. end, while a whole army corps is coming up from behind you, um, it, re it really doomed him. And it really it created an opportunity, really, that ultimately made Meade kind of look bad, but he kind of redeemed himself later. Yeah. But for but for Lee, it's clearly a missed opportunity. And, and this is the... The, 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 why it's why it's important is the campaign that follows the Gettysburg campaign. Yeah, with with both armies stripped of numbers, stripped of leadership, especially on the Union side, with all those new core guys and the eleventh and twelfth being gone, it was an opportunity Lee had. And at the end of the day, where does he find himself back in Orange County again? Yeah, and and that's that's kind of the end of it. So when you look at the end of eighteen sixty three, that fall, it doesn't just end there. And this is a fascinating study. Because it, it just it's that cat and mouse game that me and Lee play mm -hmm. for the rest of that year. I think a lot of people don't really realize. I think they don't no. really focus on anything post Gettysburg up until you get to early '64. Yeah, that's that's but what I was saying. It's like it's kind of like Gettysburg ends, and then nobody looks at that like kind of the Eastern Theater again until well, ironically, Grant is there, right? Like yeah. early 1864, and really, it's but, if you're going to yeah. study George Gordon Meade, you need to study this part of his career because it's showing like you know yes he's struggling at some points but it's also showing his strengths it's showing that he's doing stuff that hooker never did that um definitely oh. burnside didn't do and also that mcclellan didn't either but ironically this is the time when the western theater overshadows the eastern theater historically yes. when people focus on with chickamauga chattanooga everything going on yeah. well so i, I mean, think it's admittedly a, I, it is i mean chattanooga is an important city for the union to have and like this is kind of like october is kind of the lull in that campaign too you're getting into that siege of chattanooga um and you really don't have things amping back up again until um mid-november with the battles for chattanooga oh so so when you when you study this and you take a peek at it it's, it's definitely worthwhile studying because it's that psychological game between mm -hmm. between the two um and so it ends up being, like I said, a missed opportunity, but I think it's one that really helps set the stage going into 64, especially when Orland starts, where it leads the, the cat and mouse game again. Um, and this is where, where we talked before about how Grant kind of gets the pull the wool over his eyes, yes. realizing that he's the target, not Richmond. So it's not just yeah. mano a mano. The, the psychological game that takes place between the generals. Lee was brilliant at this. And whether he did this by definition of his mind or whether he just did it without even realizing he was doing it. But he had me just running around in circles yeah. in that Culpeper V. And um, it ends up in a situation where he gets away, but he's kind of lucky he got away all because of incompetence of APL. Yeah. I, I think I do. I do think though that Lee knew he had a very um, different commander in who he was facing with me, different than obviously McClellan, different than definitely Burnside and different than Hooker as well. I think Meade knew he was, you know, with a guy that was, like, yes, he could kind of pull the wool over his eyes. He could kind of, you know, make play the psychological game with him. But I think Lee knew that at a point that would run out because Meade, Meade was good. He was really good. And people don't realize that. No, he was. So I guess we can drop it here. I guess that's a place you can go visit Bristow Station for the most part. It's still very similar. You can go, like I said, you can see the train station. You can see the field. They got a nice little visitor center over there. It's a great little walking area, a nice little park, a park you can walk. Um, the spot where Hill stood on the hill is no longer there. It's a it's a park. It's um, Hill stood on the hill. A, it's like a supermarket or a, or a development or something up there now. But there's there's some sort of stores up there. But but definitely go check it out. It's a great place to visit. It's a very understudied battle. So definitely uh, with this anniversary of this battle that just happened a couple of about just about a week or so ago, yeah. it's definitely worthwhile studying. So what is next for us, Mary? 
So next up for us, we have our book club meeting with Lisa Samia on uh, Thursday, October 26, 7 p.m. Eastern time via Zoom. So if you'd like to attend um, Civil War Breakfast Club at gmail.com, we are going to be discussing her uh, new Civil War poetry book, which is in the Nameless and Faceless series that, she, series that she's written. So it's Gettysburg, Manassas and and beyond that as well. So different poems. Um she covers men, women, people that just like basically nameless and faceless that don't have kind of the voice that uh, some of the other um, figures of the Civil War have. Um, and then we will bet. Um, we also will have our Halloween episode dropping as well um, with Jay Price, oh. our first or our fourth Halloween episode that we've done with her. Um, and then after that, um, we will be having um, another our final book club of 2023 will be in November. And we will be having Tom Huntington on to talk about his book, um, Main Roads to Gettysburg, which we... I just hope this Halloween episode is not, not scary. I, I just hope it's, we keep, we keep Remember this... Remember when Jen scared you a few years ago? Uh, she's an evil person. She's scary. She's scared evil? the hell out of me oh for my no God. reason. She likes to scare me, Mary. I don't know why. I don't know why she does, but she freaked me out, though, with that story of Antietam. Oh, God, no. Nope. I'll set all said it anyway all right so off we go mary so we will definitely look forward to talking to you soon so live comes up uh, tomorrow this episode will drop tomorrow as yep. well. so any final words from you fincher well thanks for uh bringing it as you always do especially with me being in grad school right now and i'm actually doing the thing that is occupying a lot of my time is a project about the killer angels ironically yeah, no, that's pretty cool we weren't yeah. really planning on doing this episode to be honest it was kind of a last minute throw in just because um, we wanted we wanted to do one before Halloween, we didn't think we'd have time to with your score. Yeah. But said, oh, it's just real quick. Let's just kind of let's just kind of do it tonight. What do you think? We did it. So yeah. All right, off we go. Everybody have a great uh, weekend. Hopefully, where you're listening to this, the weather is good. Hopefully, um, hopefully it's a good weekend. Wouldn't it be cool if the Patriots won this weekend? Wouldn't that be cool? It ain't gonna be great. Happen, no. You know, why because AP Hills coach of the Patriots now? That's the problem. But yeah. I digress. All right, so off we go. Everybody have a great weekend. We will see you all on the other side. Okay, see you all later. Bye. Peace Bye. Out. Bye.